So we, <coughs> today we're going to talk about soils. Um, and uh, we begin with this, uh, with this basic graph we had before when we talked about plant nutrition. And we're going to talk today about the part that we didn't talk about last time, that is the soil ecology uh, part. Now, this is Hans Jenny. Hans Jenny was a famous, famous soil scientist, and he uh, laid out this uh, fundamental formula uh, where the soils, soils are a function of uh, climate, uh, what is it, climate, vegetation, topography, parent material, and time. Um, <coughs> We're going to talk about the various soils that exist around the world, and we're going to use a kind of a, what I regard as a kind of a simplified formula. Uh, I'm going to take the formal classification that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, uh, uses, and I'm going to combine that with, uh, uh, with, with what I call an origins mythology, and I'm going to interrogate, I'm going to use Jenny's formula to talk about how the USDA system uh, can be viewed as a system that, uh, that uses Jenny's formula, but talks a lot about the sort of the evolution of uh, the various soils types. That's my, my simplified formula that I'm, gonna, that, I, that I'm going to use in this lecture. Using the basic framework, we'll talk about the 12 USDA classic soil uh, <clears throat> soil types, but then we're going to sort of add a little bit of a, an interpretation of where those types come from. Now, first of all, there are three types that are based on the parent material only, and that parent material sort of fixes what they are. Then there are two that are based on time that are young soils. That's time. They're young. They're just recently formed. Then there are four that are based on whichever, what kind of vegetation, and of course the climate is what determines the vegetation, so it's a combination of the climate and the vegetation. And then uh, five, we're going to talk about time again, but we're going to talk, there are two uh, categories that are basically very old soils. So those will be the 12 categories. Uh, another category, really, which I'm not going to talk about in this lecture, but I will talk about in the next lecture, are the, the anthropogenic soils, which perhaps are the most important ones. So we begin with the, uh, with the three soil types that are based on parent material. Okay, these are histosols, andosols, and vertisols. First of all, the histosols. Uh, histo refers to tissue, and histosols are, so, are, are soils that are based on tissue. Uh, not living tissue, but dead tissues. Histosols are filled with organic matter. Uh, they are, <coughs> that's, that's one of their major characteristics. Uh, one of the best examples is in Ireland. This gentleman here, this is an old photograph. He's harvesting, uh, he's harvesting histosols. Uh, <clears throat> and they take the, basically, uh, it's a very traditional thing to do. You harvest them in bricks, you carve out little bricks, and you dry out the bricks. And it was used quite frequently as a, as a fuel uh, to heat the houses and, to, and for cooking, etc., etc. It's also used in agriculture as a, as a fertilizer in agriculture. Uh, they, and to, to this day, as you can see in this photo right here, to this day, people are harvesting these bricks uh, of peat. In, in Ireland. These are basically histosols. Um, histosols tend to form in swampy areas, in, uh, in wetlands. Uh, here's, a, here's a photograph of the, the Kern County Wildlife Refuge in California, and I took this slide specifically because this is a wildlife refuge in the middle of California, uh, California uh, vegetable production. And so what you can do is you take a, you know, most any wetland that you have, you can basically drain it and you'll have a histosol there that you can do agriculture on. And very typically, the histosols, histosols are really quite productive. That's why a lot of high valued vegetable production happens, in, happens on histosols. <coughs> um, the, the one problem uh, with, with histosols is that uh, they tend to subside I mean, the thing is, since they're mainly, or there's a, a lot of organic matter in histosols, and they, as, the, as the organic matter begins to decay, uh, sometimes accelerated by the agricultural process itself, why, as that happens, why the soils, itself, the soils themselves decay, sometimes fairly dramatically, okay? Uh, the, they're, fre they're frequently referred to as muck soils, by the way, in the United States. Uh, large concentrations of them in California and uh, and on the East Coast, in the New Jersey area, New Jersey tomato production was really famously based on, on the muck soils there. 
Okay, the second uh, soil category that's based on parent material is the andesols. Andesols are from volcanic uh, activity, either volcanic eruptions or um, pyroclastic explosions of the just volcanic ash. With, uh, with lava flows, of course, when the lava, lava hardens, why well, then it begins the process of breaking down through plant succession, etc. Uh, and eventually does become soil, but when you have a pyroclastic explosion so that you have ash, that, so that you have ash spread all around, where the ash uh, is a nice parent material to begin the formation of soil really quite, 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 quite directly. Now, frequently, these, uh, these pyroclastic explosions have a lot of mineral elements in them, mineral elements that are necessary for plant nutrition. One thing they're usually lacking is nitrogen, actually. So you'll notice when you visit volcanic sites around the world, you'll notice that in new uh, lava flows or in new uh, ash deposits, why some of the pioneers that tend to come in there are legumes for, for fairly obvious reasons. Um, these soils are... Uh, this, uh, here's an image here from Nicaragua uh, that I took. Uh, uh, Nicaragua is, uh, has, has quite a number of andesols because Nicaragua has quite a, quite a number of volcanoes there. Uh, you have a series of volcanoes from Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, up into Chiapas, Mexico. That's a chain there. And there's a lot of andesols in those areas. And some of the best agriculture is done on andesols. Uh, andesols can be relatively rich. Uh, one of the reasons they can be relatively rich, or they're famous for being relatively rich, is because they occur in tropical areas. And they occur in a lot of tropical areas that, that uh, have other soils that are really quite poor. So the andesols really kind of stand out as being really good soils uh, comparatively in, the, in, in, in these areas <coughs> where much, most of the other soils are, are, really, quite, uh, are <coughs> really quite poor. This, uh, this image from Nicaragua here, you can see in the stratigraphy, you can see those, the, all those layers there. Uh, those layers are fossil soils. And that indicates each one of those is a pyroclastic explosion from the uh, from the volcano and uh, basically turned into uh, uh, basically turned and turned into a soil which was then eventually covered by the new explosion uh, new volcanic ash coming in there uh, and and uh, uh, you can see here you can see the history of soil formation and covering soil formation and covering soil formation and covering that last um, the, 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 the top layer there is a raw volcanic ash just beginning the process of soil formation. I'm not sure when it happened, but I think it was only a couple of years before I took this photograph. Here you see a map uh, showing you, oh, well, I was going to say it's the distribution of antisols. I suppose it really is, but what it really is, it's the distribution of volcanoes in the world. And so for fairly obvious reasons, you can tell where the antisols are going to be pretty much as to from where the relatively recently active volcanoes um, are distributed and, and pretty obviously they're distributed on the margins of all the tectonic plates as you can I think you can see pretty evidently in here in this in, in this image. The final soil type based on parent material, material uh, is, is called uh, vertisol. Vertisols are uh, these soils that have uh, they're dominated by these these clays that swell and shrink and swell and shrink depending on how wet it is so in the wet season why they swell in the dry season they shrink now when they shrink why they sort of congeal together and form these cracks like you can see in the in in, in this image right here uh, they can be <laughs> they can be challenging for for constructions uh, if you look at the, in this image, you can see this is a this is a house that was built on a on a vertisol. And what happens over the seasons, as you go from wet season to dry season, why there's a lot of movement of the surface of the land, and that frequently causes uh, constructional damage. Um, I know that uh, when I was living in Nicaragua a while back, as you, when you go from the capital city of Managua up to the up to a northern city there, particularly in the city of Leon, where you pass over. Uh, areas of vertisols and you can always tell when you were on a vertisol because the highway suddenly was filled with potholes uh, very very typical thing that vertical vert, um, vertisols do uh, vertisols have this unusual typo, type of erosion associated with them in those cracks there in the dry season why the dry as the soil is drying out why the 
soil dust, you know, the so, so, small particles, they fall down into the cracks. And so then when uh, the wet season comes and the crack and the, the clays expand, why those cracks, they, 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 they come together, right? And they squeeze the particles that were there. It's kind of, sort of like a, like a, um, a, a vertical, uh, a, <coughs> a vertical erosion of, of the soil, so to speak. I mean, that's not really the case, but you, you get the idea that the particles get smaller and smaller as they fall into the cracks and get squeezed in the rainy, in the rainy season. These kinds of soils can be very challenging for agriculture um, because, of, well, for fairly obvious physical reason, you have to get the roots down into the uh, down into the soil, and then what you get is that uh, that, that compression. Um, and there's a, there, it, 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 a huge problem with puddling uh, in the rainy season, especially and and, and when you're trying to irrigate them. Uh, there are some classic uh, utilizations of the vertisols. The, Famous black Texas cotton soils are vertisols. Um, uh, obviously, the paddy rice production on vertisols works pretty well because they form a nice basis for the, uh, for the uh, aquatic paddy. Next, we have two soils that, uh, that I'm going to say are characterized by the fact that they're relatively young, okay? The, uh, and in order to understand what, the, what this actually means of being young, uh, part of the, and maybe the most important uh, aspect of foil, soil, the f soil formation process is the formation of layers. So, uh, formation of, we call them horizons in the soil or soil layers, if you like. Now, you begin with basically three layers. You have the A layer, the B layer, and the C layer, okay? The A layer is the topsoil, the B layer is the subsoil, and the C layer is, uh, is this material that's called uh, it, it's all uh, non-congealed material, you know, rocks and dust and things like that. It's on top of the bedrock, uh, but it's not connected to the bedrock, okay? So those are, the, those are your three basic, three basic levels. You have the A, the B, and the C. Now, in addition to that, and this depends on the soil uh, to the extent that you have these other layers also, you have the O layer, and the O layer stands for organic material. And that's the organic, uh, the organic layer on top of the A layer. And then you have the E layer for E stands for alluviation. And that's a layer down below where you tend in certain soils, you get this tendency to accumulate the leachate, the things that leach down from the A layer into the, into the E layer. And uh, you'll see some soils have uh, a very, very characteristic uh, E layer. And this actually characterizes some uh, some soils. Now, <clears throat> antisols are characterized by basically not having not having layers. Okay, I mean they're brand new soils. They're soils that are just in the process of being formed and just in the process of, of developing layers. Okay. Uh, inceptisols are basically just soils that are go a little that are a little further. They have the initial development of the of, uh, of soil horizons. Okay. Now they uh, this image shows you. Um, I just dug up a piece of what was soil, I think. There was vegetation growing on top of it. But when you look at it, all you see are roots penetrating into what is volcanic ash. This was in the Arenal volcano in Costa Rica that I picked this up. And I'm not sure what this is. It's uh, it, Well, first of all, it's an andesol. There's no question about that because it's, that, because it's volcanic. But, uh, you know, andesols used to be classified as uh, either andesols or inceptosols based on the fact that they're very young. Uh, especially when, well, when they're very young, at least. Uh, but now we were, but, but this is, nevertheless, this is an example of a soil that's in the process of formation, okay? So is it, um, is it characteristic of what you would call an antisol or an inceptisol or what? Are there layers there? Not really, not really layers. So um, uh, this would, if it wasn't an antisol, I would call it the, uh, an antisol. Uh, in this image, I just wanted to emphasize the, uh, the, the, the nature of some entosols and inceptosols. You take a, um, a, a meandering river like this, uh, the river floods every year. And of course that can be very important for agriculture. These floodplains are frequently very, very rich agricultural areas. But when you stop to think about it from the point, from the point of view of soil formation and soil categories and things like that, um, 
every year it floods, it brings all that organic material that's in, that's in the river water uh, up there, deposits them on the land, and that's why alluvial areas are usually very good for agriculture. Um, uh, the classification of alluvial soils, I mean, you call them alluvial soils simply because they're the process of how they're formed, but they're kind of continually being formed over and over again uh, as the river floods. Uh, <clears throat> the, the degree to which they develop soil horizons obviously has to do with how frequently the river floods. If it floods every year, if it floods every year obviously it's going to be very difficult to form any kind of horizons at all, but if it floods every Every hundred years, for example, a hundred years is enough time to begin forming horizons, and so you might go from an entosol to an inceptosol. But uh, this is a uh, just an example of how uh, entosols and inceptosols can be very, very productive agricultural soils, as they are when you're talking about alluvial soils. So now we move to the soil types that are defined by mainly by the vegetation, the climate and the vegetation also, because climate and vegetation, you know, are so closely related to one another. Uh, the first ones to consider are basically desert soils, aridosols they're called. And aridosols are uh, dry. <laughs> they're usually formed on a sand basis. And uh, surprisingly, sometimes they're very, very good for agriculture. The problem that aridosols have is a lack of water. So here in these two images from Egypt, for example, uh, this is the Nile, this is on the Nile, and uh, I, I show these two images because one of, the, you know, one of the biggest and most important civilizations in the world was basically formed on an andesol. Now it was an andesol that was also alluvial, um, but uh, it was, uh, uh, the flooding of the Nile was an important thing every year, as this uh, image, this very old image shows that Nile, the Nile flooded. But as you move away from the alluvial floodplain, of course, as those are all andesols, and uh, excuse me, aridosols, and on those aridosols, why uh, you had agriculture, but the agriculture was an irrigated agriculture all, all the time. So aridosols can be good for agriculture, but the, the problem is, is, is water. Now, it's not so much just water, but it's also the parent material tends to be sand. Now, here's an image showing you the, uh, the classic cal categorization of uh, soil particles, so soil mineral particles more than anything. So we have the bigger ones are called sand, and then we have the medium-sized ones, which are called, uh, called silt, and then the smallest ones are called clay. Now, soil texture is a really Im exceedingly important aspect of soils. If you have a soil that if the aridosols tend to be very sandy soils, and you can sort of get the impression if you just look at this, uh, this image here, uh, sandy soils have a lot of pores in them, right? So what that means is that water is going to, well, first of all, it's gonna filter through as fa pretty fast, but also it's gonna evaporate pretty fast also. So not only are aridosols typically in areas that are relatively dry, they're also typically the kind of soils that has a lot of sand and therefore uh, has problems with evapor evap evaporation and has problems with, uh, with, uh, with uh, loss, loss of water through gravity. Now, at, at this point, it's useful to talk about the general problem of uh, soil textural analysis. Uh, this uh, triangle here is what is normally used to class classify soils. As you can see, it's a triangle and it, it, it plots the proportion of those three different types of, uh, types of uh, those three different sizes of particles, whether you're from sand to silt to clay on the three faces of the triangle. And you can see for yourself what, they're, what the categories are labeled as. Those are formal labels that uh, if everybody agrees to those particular labels, uh, it seems pretty arbitrary to put the, put the limitations where they are right now, but nevertheless, those are the ones that, that everybody seems to use. So if you have, you can have at, 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 the, at the margins, of course, you have, uh, you have sandy, sand, sand soil or silt soil or clay soil. Those are the, uh, you know, the three peaks of the, the three peaks of the, of the triangle. But in addition to that, you can have sandy, sandy soil, sandy clay soil, all those different categories. It's widely 
felt, and with some reason, I, I, this is just a rule of thumb, uh, is felt that the, um, the, the you know, sort of the, the middle of the, the middle ground of that triangle is the best place to be for agriculture. That is the, uh, <clears throat> the area where you have sort of a, 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 mix, a, a proper mixture of sand, silt, and clay, okay? And this, these soils are called loam soils. That's the formal definition of loam soils is in that little category you see here, which is labeled loam. Um, Uh, with reference to that uh, that uh, textural analysis, the textural analysis triangle that we have, uh, so far the soils that we talked about fit very nicely in there, right? I mean, on the one hand, you have the um, you have the the vertisols that I talked about, the histosols, and you have the uh, eritosols uh, that I just talked about, right? And they kind of fit right in the corners of that uh, soil textural textural analysis. So they, of course, by definition, are the only ones that do. So we now move on to spodosols. Spodosols are the soils that tend to be formed in coniferous forests of some sort, one, one form or another. Um, they tend to be, uh, they tend to form in areas which are, well, coniferous forests tend to form in areas that are a little bit more acid and they also contribute then to the acidity of the soil as, as they grow. Uh, one characteristic of uh, spodosols, which is really important, is the formation of a very, very, uh, very impressive, shall we say, E layer, the, uh, the alluviation level la layer. You know where all the where all the uh, uh, nutrient where everything's le leaching out uh, there. Uh, this example is a beautiful example for you. You can see the very white area. That's all of the uh, material that has leached from the upper surfaces and sort of congregated in this, in this zone right here, which is by definition the uh, alluviation level. Um, frequently, the, these, uh, these uh, um, spodosols, they have a, a, a clay layer, and that E layer forms a, a fairly thick lay, uh, layer of clay and uh, sometimes the water can't penetrate through there. So if the E layer is relatively high, why that means that you're gonna get kind of a, um, especially in the wet season, why you're gonna get kind of a, 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 you know, a platform there that water's not gonna be able to penetrate through. So you do get, you do get a bit of puddling in some of those, uh, some of those, uh, some of those soils. Now, spodosols are high, so highly variable uh, that, uh, I mean, some of them are relatively good for agriculture, some of them are relatively bad for agriculture. So we actually have a subcategorization that I think is pretty useful to, um, for, to, to look at when you're talking specifically about spodosols. Uh, here's the subclassification here. And uh, well, you can see for yourself, there's a, a sort, of, sort of a sub triangle indicating uh, whether it's wet, cold, and amount of organic matter uh, that's a, that's a form that triangle to try to categorize, uh, to subcategorize the spodosols. Uh, this is especially useful when one is, can, uh, one is when concerned with trying to develop ag agro ecosystems in, in a spodosol area, which sometimes is fairly difficult. Now we come to alpha sols. Uh, another type of soil that's based on uh, based on the vegetation formations. Now, it, it, I put up the map here first. You can see where the distribution of alpha sols is in the world, and you'll note uh, uh, that it has a kind of a strange distribution in that there's a large number of alpha sols that are in the north. You see a big concentration of them in Eastern Europe, uh, going uh, going off through Russia and into the into the Asia into Asia, and then in North America you see them also. Uh, that's all in the no northern temperate deciduous forest. Originally, vegetation was the northern temperate deciduous forest. Then you have a bunch of that, them that are in the tropical areas, and all those in the tropical areas are in tropical savannas. Now, the processes, ecological processes that are operative in those two vegetation types are obviously very diff different, uh, yet they gave rise to soils that have enough characteristics in common that uh, soil scientists for the U.S. Department of Agriculture felt that they should be classified as being the same, being basically the same kind of soil. Uh, so what we really have is, in my opinion, we have two kinds of alpha sols. 
we have temperate alpha sols and we have tropical alpha sols. Um, I'm not sure anybody but me uses that classification, but I find it a useful classification. Uh, so the temperate uh, alpha sols are based on these kinds of forests, and I put this colorful slide up here to emphasize the fact that um, these are deciduous, they go through the regular cycle, and they're characterized by this. This is what we refer to as winter. And uh, 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 before winter, what we have, and here's my son Jamie illustrating for you, uh, one of the characteristic features of alpha sols, there's a huge number of leaves that fall in the fall, and those leaves then, they decompose, uh, presumably enough by the time that the spring flush comes after the winter, why their the nutrients are all uh, exposed and ready for the plants to pick up. Okay, so that's your normal cycle of the deciduous uh, deciduous eastern uh, of the deciduous forest, northern deciduous forest, which has uh, contributed to the development of these these kinds of soils, the alpha soils. In the tropics, on the other hand, the tropics usually are savanna areas, as indicated by this uh, uh, group of elephants in Amboseli National Park in Kenya, and uh, um, and this giant ant eater in the Pantanal in in Brazil, and uh, uh, these. Uh, these systems are based on based on fire. Uh, fires come through regularly, and the fire maintains the grasslands as as grasslands uh, with isolated trees. Sometimes, of course, but the, the process is really quite different than the process of andesol formation, the deciduous deciduous forest zone, uh, deciduous forest um, of, of the northern northern zones. The next soils based on the vegetation type are the mollusols. Now, your mollusols are the, the big agricultural, uh, agricultural soil for commercial agricultural, at least. Uh, these are the, uh, in, in Russia, they're referred to as the Chernozem, so you'll see that a lot in the literature, the Chernozem soils. Uh, the USDA system calls them mollusols. Uh, and they are classically, uh, th these are the classic soils of prairies. I put this image up here. Uh, indicating what the main feature is uh, of mollusols. The, the, the prairie burns on a regular basis. As the prairie burns on a regular basis, why uh, all that organic matter is put into the soil. Uh, <clears throat> it, it is effectively biochar that gradually penetrates into the soil. Some of the biochar is actually very old, but uh, we must remember that an awful lot of the mollusols that exist in Eastern North America and, uh, and uh, Asia and Eastern Europe also, uh, were, they were under, uh, they were under uh, a huge ice block not so long ago. But uh, 10,000, 10, 13, 14, 15,000 years ago, years worth of development has, uh, has created a soil which is really rich in, uh, rich in carbon, uh, uh, rich in or frequently very rich in organic material also. Uh, you know, dark colored, really rich soils. These are the soils of the corn and the wheat belt of, of the U.S. and uh, Eastern, Eastern Europe and Asia. Now, one of the things that is characteristic of these soils, uh, the vegetation that grows on these soils tends to be this perennial vegetation, which burns on a very frequent basis. So it never gets very large. Uh, that's part of, that's uh, part of the consequence of burning, of course. Um, but what it does is they do get very large under the ground. The roots penetrate very deeply under the ground, and so the ecosystem that exists uh, is mainly under the ground, and it can go pretty deep. It gets into the subsoil, and so what you can imagine is happening there as the roots get penetrate down into the subsoil, why they're also bringing all the bacteria, the microbiome down there with them, and they're creating the situation where they're creating a situation where they are actually exploring a huge uh, area of the potential ecosystem, way more than the kind of agriculture that has replaced those natural systems. Uh, here's an image, uh, for example, this, this is an image of a, of a prairie plant. This is uh, annual wheatgrass uh, showing the root system uh, <clears throat> that exists. Now, when you stop to think about uh, the uh, the, we have to think about uh, our problem with, with uh, global climate change, for example, all the carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. All those prairie soils that have been in that kind of agriculture, monocultural agriculture of, uh, you know, of wheat and corn and, and upland rice, 
that has been effectively uh, mining the carbon out of the soil and putting it into the air, putting, uh, putting it into the air. Uh, <clears throat> but the, 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 the biochar that has been put into the soil over those many, many years is not being renewed any longer because the root systems simply don't go down as deep as they used to go down. So some people do argue that uh, transforming the, the way we do agriculture on these mollusols so that we, uh, we're performing, we're, we're using more perennial type uh, crops so that the roots go down and with those roots going down deep into the soil while we're storing more carbon in the soil and when the bacteria and other, other elements of the microbiome go down with the roots, why that's yet more carbon that's going down into the soil. So uh, there's a movement to sort of try to transform, in the long haul at least, to try to transform uh, the kind of agriculture that's done in mollusols into uh, <coughs> away from a uh, system with, uh, with short root systems, uh, short root systems like wheat, like corn, uh, into systems which have bigger root systems. Uh, the land, the uh, land institute in Kansas has taken this as their main, as their main research uh, priority to try and develop uh, <clears throat> perennial grasses that will, on the one hand, produce grain for people to eat, but on the other hand, produce roots that go way down into the soil, uh, which will mine the soil deeper and also bring carbon deeper into the soil to store carbon on a relatively permanent basis. Finally, we come to the, uh, the soils that are the very old, the time is the most important thing, the soils that are very old soils. Now, you probably recall this, uh, this slide that I, uh, this, this image that I showed you earlier on when we were talking about plant nutrition, and I pointed out that one of the things that happens during the process of weathering, when the soils become weathered, is that the colloidal particles, they kind of break down. And as they break down, of course, they become smaller, and there's a iron and aluminum uh, ions really that are embedded inside of the crystal structures and that's as those crystal structures break open or in the case of organic matter it's uh, slightly different but more or less the same thing the iron and the aluminum ions they come get spread out into the soil so you have two different things that happen when you get uh, the result is a soil that looks like this then and it's a soil that on the one hand the soil particles uh, the colloidal particles are actually much smaller on the other hand, there's more iron and aluminum, other ions too, but iron and aluminum are the most important ones in the soil. Now, what you will notice is that the iron and the aluminum, and there's a lot, lots of them in the soil then, what they do is, since they're cations, they can compete with the hydrogen cations uh, for the whatever negative sites there are on the soil colloids. Now, two things have happened here. The soil colloids have gotten smaller, and, they, and therefore they have some sm uh, 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 fewer negative sites on their surface, but also those negative sites are taken up by the ions now that are in solution. So there's more hydrogen solution, which lowers the pH considerably. So what you get is a soil that um, actually pretty bad for agriculture, has a very low pH, it's acidic, and it <clears throat> does not hold on to the nutrients very well. You know, there's that buffering capacity that the soil collides usually pr pr uh, produce in other soils where you have a large number of negative charges so that the cations are kind of held in suspension inside the soil solution. Well, in these oxisols and ultisols, the tendency is to lose a lot of those negative charges, have a higher, have a lower pH, and all those, uh, and the good nutrients now, a lot of the cations at least, the cations are, are now no longer held inside of the soil solution, and they sort of leach out just like the anions did before. Finally, I'd like to just show you this map. This is a map of the uh, the worldwide distribution of soil types. Now, the soil types are not necessarily all packed up in one general area, and you can go to a, like an area like Puerto Rico, for example, you find little patches of oxisols all over Puerto Rico, and sort of interspersed with some of the entosols and inceptosols, etc. But you can see certain kinds of patterns. In the world map, you can see the bright red, those are the oxisols, and you can see how they're sort of concentrated in the Brazilian Amazon and the Congo Basin. Uh, you can see where the mollusols are. The mollusols are obviously the place where your, uh, <clears throat> your corn, corn and wheat belts are in both North America and, uh, and Euro Europe and Asia. And you can see several other patterns that are there. If you sort of stare at this for a while, you can, 
you can kind of pick out the various patterns that exist. Um, that says something about agriculture also, but don't forget that you can have any soil type, not, not, not absolutely everywhere, but you can have patches of soil types and, it's, and these world maps, they tell you a little bit, but they're not the whole story.